talk in the microphone because I have okay. a soft voice. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, so, Amilani, tell me your experience uh, from the States. We're going to hit all those different subjects. You know how I get down with yeah. Afro Latino world. Um, again, thank you so much for being with us. It's a great pleasure. Okay, so tell me a little bit how you began this, this love for music. Well, uh, for me, I started in African dance. Ever since I was about four years old, I was a part of a Yoruba dance company. Um, <laughs> and uh, we used to tour, and um, dance is my first love. We had to learn the dance, but we also had to learn the drum. So I can drum, and I can recognize drum rhythms too, because I grew up with that. Um, what I also love about it is that we had to learn culture. On Saturdays, we would go and we would um, we would sit down, and the girls would be separated from the boys. So we would all come together, and we would have language lessons. We would learn how to make things like you know herbal things. Like we would learn how to make pomiero, which is like spiritual water. We would learn how to make that. We would learn how to make acara, you know, from fresh from black eyed peas. We would learn how to grind them and blend them and then make fried bean cake, you know, we would learn how to sew. So if if I can find some throwback pictures of when I was in a dance company when I was younger, we made our own outfits. Or we would, um, we would not only make our own outfits, but everything had a meaning. Um, and <laughs> our first dance was called Egbe Moremi, and Moremi, is the name of a warrior. Well, she, she sacrificed herself for her people. Her people kept getting defeated by the Igbo tribe. And so she sacrificed herself and she would come back and give the secrets to her people so they would no longer be defeated. Those kind of stories and those kind of things, it always stuck with me. You know, it's a natural part of me. So I grew up with culture, with tradition, with a sense of leadership, but also a sense that we don't only belong to ourselves, that we belong to this bigger community, and our purpose is much bigger than our individualistic goals. Okay, okay. Um, tell me about this new album. Okay, the new album is called Oreye Yeo. Oreye Yeo is a dedication, pure dedication to my Yeye Oshun. I've done a lot of pieces for vanity. I've done a lot of pieces, well not necessarily for vanity, but where I just touched the surface. Uh, because, <laughs> this is getting my face. Um, where, because I, I have had the fortune to be in the studios of some of the best musicians in the world, from Trinidad and Tobago to even here in the United States, you know, I have really had some beautiful experiences. I had great mentors in music. Um, some of them who <laughs> taught me the business of music, but the business of music doesn't always match with your personal, your, yourself, your entire self. And Oreye Yeo, I think, is the first album I truly did for, you know, not marketing, not for anything like that. Like this one was really from the heart you know, and I feel it. I don't know who else feels it. But I feel it. We feel it. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's what it was coming from. It was coming from heart and soul, from the deepest part of me. That's what what Yeo is. Okay. So are you doing? Because I see the video on YouTube, right? Yes. Are you doing also a documentary to that? I have done some documentary pieces. I think as time goes on, because these pieces are so deep and. The stories behind them, you know, like they have a whole lot of meaning. I think it would be good for me to go deeper into each of the songs and what they represent. Right, right, right. Like the Patakis and yeah. it's connected. Because it I seen the video that you did with a tune. Yeah, right? yeah. That you were by a beautiful river. Yeah. You were in the middle. Yeah. How did that go? You know what? That was one of those things. It was, it was not planned. Um, actually, what happened was, I was actually in Georgia representing my Filipino side. I was at a conference showing uh, my film, and one of my godchildren was right there in Georgia, and he's a child of Ogun. And I was like, you know what? Let's go to the woods. Let's go shoot a video today. 
And he was like, I'm down, you know? And it just so happened that I'm a child of Oshun, he's a child of Ogun, and so it was that true <laughs> energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the river, it was just so beautiful. And if you can imagine, <laughs> when I was coming out this uh, of the woods, this beautiful yellow and orange snake went right under my foot. Didn't bite me, didn't anything. It just went right under my foot and back into the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so after these these music videos, you're gonna do may, maybe do the documentary. Yeah. Okay. So tell me a little bit the Philippine side. Okay, <laughs> the Filipino side. That's a side that I hadn't really talked a lot about before. You know, one because navigating that community has not been easy. I've been doing a lot of work in the Afro-Latinx community trying to bring about visibility and I love where that movement is going. I love that there are so many new voices who are carrying the movement to places that when I started that, you know, years and years ago, I could never imagine. I feel that that movement is definitely safe in the hands that is in now that where people are nuancing and asking the right questions and really saying wait a minute who gets to call themselves afro latino you know it's more than just having a black great 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 great, great grandmother you know it has to do with how we navigate through this world on the other hand in the filipino community where are the voices can we even name one person who is speaking out against the injustices against black people in the Philippines? Nobody, I can name nobody. I know that they have, um, you know, like celebrities and things like that who have managed to break through the cracks, but they're still marginalized. People are still doing films in blackface in the Philippines uh, and see no problem with it. They're still doing movies that show people with Afro hair like mine you know, and by them having Afro hair, it means that they're ugly. We're the butt of the joke. So I feel a responsibility to stand up and to speak out and to be present, not as a celebrity, you know, not as the token singer or actor or anything like that, but as a true voice of somebody who is about uplifting and breaking through this it's worse than a glass ceiling. I don't even know what to call it. There's not even a floor, a roof, or a ceiling for people who look like us in the Philippines. And there are so many natural-born Filipinos who look just like us. Right, so to my understanding, I don't know too much about the Philippine history, but I know that Philippines have Mayanates as well, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the history behind the Philippines having Mayanates? Okay, so the history is that um, the Philippines is one of the only countries in Asia that was colonized by Spain for 300 years. Just like Latin America, how they want to talk a lot about Columbus and all these other, you know, colonizers. When it comes to the Philippines, the story starts with Magellan. And uh, that's unfortunate, you know. So Spain was in the Philippines a long time. Uh, it used to be the official language of government, and in fact, their way of classifying people was through giving them Spanish last names. So my Spanish last name, Alarcón, is not from Latin America, it's from the Philippines. It's from my Filipino grandfather, and you know, uh, that whole history. So, so I'm guessing that they also went to the Costa system as well. Of course, it still exists. It right. still exists to this day where when I'm watching the movies, people get whiter and whiter and whiter, you know? And people who look like us don't even get a chance. It happens to me. I walk into a room, I mean, I've never experienced such rejection, you know? I've gotten up and sing, and like, I, you know, you, you've seen in my bio and things like that, you know, I've been recognized by Grammy. I have sang in front of huge crowds. I grew up on the stage. So, you know, it ain't just my shango flex. Like, I know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But I have gone to sing, and people have turned their entire back on me. And it is the nastiest feeling, and it's the most hurtful thing. But I can't stop. I won't stop. That's right. Yeah. That's the only way to go up there. Yep. So, 
Now we talked about the album, right? Yeah. yeah. Now is there an album release date? Oh, it, it just came out yesterday. It came out yesterday? We got Filipino, that means Filipino roots. Um, it's a tribute to my roots in Sambuanga, Philippines. That's the southern Philippines. Um, and actually, the city where my family is from is the town where the official language is still Spanish. It's called Chabacano. Nice. And so if you heard the people speak, you would understand what they're saying. Because it's another, it's the only country in Asia that speaks a Creole Spanish. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, let's talk about the documentary, that new documentary, and let's talk about a little bit about your community and your sure. organization, Negra Lives. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So my new documentary is called A Part of the Story. And over the pandemic, I went to go look for my father's side of the family. Um, his side was a mystery for a long time. But because I, I dealt with that rejection from the Filipino community, I, I never, you know, thought that I would find anybody. And then I was worried about what happened when I found them. But I went to California for a week because I did find them. I had to go the old school way because when you have family not born in the United States, you have to um, you have to use old ways. So I contacted people in the Philippines to take a picture of my grandfather and go door to door <laughs> and do you know that way. And I did find my actual family from the Philippines. All of our stories matched up. The pictures that we had, they matched up, and I had baby pictures of my family members who I just met. I had their baby pictures in my grandmother's album. So I was able to like make the link. But um, I got off, I have no idea what the world, okay, so yeah, I did a documentary right. about what that experience was like. And um, it was a beautiful experience. Um, I have the best aunts and uncles in the world. And um, so that is touring now. And then I have Latinegras, which um, was about loving the skin you're in. Because when I first moved to Miami, it was a little difficult because this was not like the Cuba I knew when I was a child, you know? Like, I mean, maybe I was too young to understand everything that was going on. I spent a little time there when I was um, really young, but coming over here, I never encountered that, you know, level of racism where you go in the line and somebody before you who looks like a white Latino, they speak Spanish to them, then I get in the line next and then you switch automatically to English or I respond to you in Spanish and then you, you switch back to English or act like you don't understand what I'm saying, you know? So what? Huh? You know, so that, that kind of stuff or when people look at us and say, how did you learn to speak Spanish? Well, how did you learn? You know? <laughs> yeah, so that's what inspired that. That's what inspired it. That's great. So, Amilani, mm -hmm. can we please listen to some of your music? Absolutely.
Ale.